This is a book called Freedom River by Doreen Rappaport with pictures by Brian Collier. Um, this book has won one of the Coretta Scott King Awards and I really like it because it's about um, a family. Before the Civil War, Kentucky was a slave state and Ohio a free state. In the 1800s, the Ohio River was less than a thousand feet wide at Ripley, Ohio. Runaway slaves from Kentucky followed the Maysville Road to the river and then swam or rode across it to freedom. Sympathetic whites and blacks in Ripley hid the fugitives and then transported them farther north. John Parker was a successful business person and one of Ripley's most active conductors on the Underground Railroad. He had been born a slave and earned enough money to buy his freedom, but he never forgot the pain of being taken from his mother's loving arms when he was eight years old. This is a true story of one of his journeys into Kentucky to help an African-American family escape to freedom. Listen, listen. I heard last night someone helped a slave woman across the river, said one of the workers at John Parker's foundry. John Parker couldn't take credit for this escape, but it pleased him enormously to hear about it. Maybe Mr. Parker helped him escape, said Jim Shrove, an iron molder. My father says he's helped hundreds. Jim raised his voice. I dare him to cross the river and try to steal my father's slaves, taunted Jim. If he does, my father will set the dogs on him and rip him to shreds. John knew if he crossed the river, he might end up dead. There was a thousand dollar reward for him, dead or alive, in Kentucky. But he couldn't let that stop him. Slavery was too evil. He had to keep helping others, no matter what the risk. A week later, in November, when the moon was but a sliver, John rode across the Ohio River to the Shrove Plantation. Wait, wait, listen, listen. Only crickets and bullfrogs break in the silence of the fall night. Suddenly, footsteps, closer, louder. The crescent moon illuminated a black man. John approached him and touched him. I have a boat waiting to row you across the river to freedom, he whispered. I, I, I can't go, the man stammered. I can't leave my wife and baby. Without warning, the man screamed and ran away. Suddenly, a white man, swinging a club, charged at John. John ducked. The man dropped his weapon and grabbed John around the waist. Down, down. The man wrestled him to the ground and punched him in the face. John grabbed a handful of dirt and threw it into the man's eyes. Run, run. Back to the river. Back to his skiff. Row, row. Away from the slave state of Kentucky to the free state of Ohio. December came and brought patches of ice on the river. In January, the river froze. Rowing across it was impossible now. Jim Shrove continued to taunt John that he was too scared to go after his father's slaves. John didn't answer his taunts. He practiced being patient as he waited for spring. In April, when the river thawed, he returned to the plantation, even more determined. Wait, wait. Listen, listen. The moon shone on the man John had seen in November. John followed him into a cabin. I've come back for you and your family. Leave Isaac and me alone, said the man's wife, Sarah. Since you came last fall, Master Shrove watches our every move. He took my baby from me and makes me sleep her sleep every night on the foot of his bed. Isaac, sneak into his room while he sleeps and take her, John urged. Too dangerous, said Isaac. The master keeps a loaded pistol at his side, and he swears he will kill her and anyone who comes for her. John shuddered at Shrove's cruelty, for he knew the baby's parents loved her too much to leave her behind. He returned home, but he could not sleep that night. He felt responsible for Sarah being separated from her baby. He had to go get this family to freedom. The next night, he rode across the river again. He tied his skiff to a wooden post and untied the other boat there. He smiled as it drifted away. Get up, get up. John shook Isaac and Sarah from sleep. Go away, leave us alone, Sarah begged. I know you are afraid, but trust me. I will get your child out of Shrove's bedroom, John said. No, no, it will never work, Sarah said. He will kill you and my baby. It will work, John insisted. Wait for me in the woods. If you hear gunshots, run back to your cabin. He took off his shoes. Isaac, hold these until I return. John hurried to the main house, into the pantry, into the kitchen. There was no sign of the vicious guard dogs Jim Shrove had threatened him with. Into the hall, a headlight seeped from under the door of Shrove's bedroom. John tiptoed toward it. 
Still no dogs. He held his breath. The Lord must be watching over me, he thought. He gently pushed the door open. On the far side of the room, a candle flickered. Shrope and his wife were sleeping. A pistol rested next to the candle. John clutched the gun in his pocket. He listened for the breathing of Shrope and his wife. It was regular and smooth. He relaxed a bit. He saw the baby sleeping at the foot of the bed. She was no more than five feet away, but she seemed unreachable. Crawl, crawl. The floor creaked slightly as he inched toward the child. Three feet more. Shrove tossed restlessly in his sleep. Two feet, one foot. John scooped up the baby and threw her pillow at the candle. The room went dark. The pistol clanked to the floor. Shrove awakened with a start. <gasps> run, run. Down the hall, to the kitchen, through the pantry, out the door. The baby started crying. There was no time to soothe her. John heard short running feet and cursing mouth close behind. Run, run! Down the road, to the water, to the skiff. Isaac and Sarah ran close to John's heels. Gunshots rang out in the air behind them. John untied his boat. Get in and lower your heads, he ordered. Sarah clutched her baby. More gunfire. Faster, faster! John pulled the oars and ignored the flashes of gunfire from the Kentucky side. When the oars hit the Ohio shore, John saw it. He had tempted fate and won. He hurried his passengers onto shore. Isaac, my shoes. I dropped them when I was running. No time to worry now. Run, run, to the safe house. In minutes, the family was hidden under straw in a wagon to be driven farther north by the next conductor on the Underground Railroad. John was barely home. When there was a banging at his front door, he walked slowly downstairs. Who is it, he asked. Jim Shrope. John opened the door and pretended surprise. Why are you here? Jim pushed John's shoes into his face. To exchange your shoes for my father's slaves. I've never seen those shoes before, and I don't want them, said John indignantly. His tone turned gracious. But you're welcome to come in and look for your missing slaves. Jim gripped the shoes tightly in his hand and searched room after room. He banged closet doors, knocked on walls, pulled out drawers, and threw clothing on the floor. John did not care about the noise or the mess, for the longer Jim searched, the greater the head start for Sarah, Isaac, and their child. Listen, listen. I heard someone rode a slave family across the river last night, said one of John's workers. John waited to hear what Jim Shrove would say. He did not hear his voice. Jim had not reported to work this morning. He never returned to work for John Harper.